Style Health Coaching Program, and we are now launching um, a My Go To Doc Functional Medicine Program. Um, unfortunately, Dr. William Shelton, who's coming on as our functional medicine specialist, kind of, you know, we got the wires crossed there with the communication and uh, he wasn't ready to, to join us live today. Uh, we're going to be rescheduling him for Tuesday so that we can kind of do an intro to Dr. Shelton um, and, uh, and kind of like, you know, learn about him and why we chose to bring him on specifically. Uh, and for today, and, and I'm, I'm sorry that we're late and we were supposed to start like 18 minutes ago, but we were just, you know, scrambling at the last minute. So um, so for today, I just want, you know, I'll, I'll answer some audience questions if there are any. And um, and I'll also just talk a little bit about functional medicine. Um, so so like basically what what is functional medicine? I think there's a lot of different um, definitions of it, but my understanding of it is essentially you're trying to regain healthy functioning, right? Whatever it takes. And it's kind of a systems-based approach, which means that you're not isolating symptoms or diseases. So like you don't just look at the endocrine system if you have an endocrine disease. So if you have diabetes, you don't just focus on the pancreas and ignore everything else. Everything is interconnected. And the reason for your diabetes might be somewhere else in the body. It might be somewhere else in time and space. Like it might be something was triggered in your past, you know, some toxin exposure or something is now presenting itself as diabetes. That's just kind of the tip of the iceberg. And you go down and you search for the root cause. It's kind of like what, you know, if anyone of you have watched House MD, you know, that TV show, it's kind of like that, actually. Um, a lot of what he does is what I would consider functional medicine. So he's digging down and trying to find like a detective searching for like, what is the root cause in this specific patient for this abnormality? Um, and there, there recently, there's been kind of this little mini tweet storm from um, one of our summit participants, um, Chris Masterjohn, where he was like, going through different house episodes and he was like pointing out how like house is like you know in this episode he figures out that this person has like berry berry or something and you know the, these weird kind of like off kilter and kind of like you know diagnoses that you don't often see um but it's really like his approach is really just a functional medicine approach where he's like thinking like okay this presentation okay it, it could just be a pneumonia but there's something weird about it um so Maybe it's some one of these zebras, right? In medicine, it's like when you hear hoofbeats, think horses, but sometimes it's a zebra, even though, you know, horses are far more common in the U.S. at least than zebras. Um, so that that adage that you're taught in med school is basically meant to convey the point that, like, when you see a symptom or a sign or something in a patient, think of the most common causes instead of the most rare causes. Um, but sometimes something will clue you in that this is one of those rare causes. This is one of those zebras. So functional medicine, it's not always about zebras. It's, it's actually in practice more often about the horses, but it's about the, the, the zebras in terms of the causes of like the, what's leading to the manifestation of this horse. So like what I mean by horse is like, okay, the diabetes, it's a very common illness um, or high, high blood pressure. It's a very common illness, but the, the things that are leading to high blood pressure or diabetes or any chronic illness, Lyme disease, long COVID, whatever it is, um, long COVID may not be the best example, but in, in all of these chronic, you know, lifestyle diseases, they're, they're what's called multifactorial, right, by, by mainstream medicine, which means that there's not a single point mutation or a single genetic cause or a single nutrient abnormality that's causing this. In some cases, a single micronutrient abnormality could cause a similar problem or a single genetic mutation could cause that uh, similar disease. So you have like type 1 diabetes <clears throat> versus type 2 diabetes. But in, in the vast majority of people with the chronic kind of lifestyle version of the the disease, there's lifestyle factors, there's toxin exposures, there are, you know, it tends to be stress related, too, much, too little exercise, not the right diet, food, you know, intolerances, maybe a chronic infection. And that's where the, the functional medicine part of it comes in. We're, we're digging into these um, causes to come up with a picture of like, what's the specific kind of like pattern of causes that's leading to the manifestation of that disease in you specifically. Um, so two different diabetics, they look the same on the surface, but underneath they're completely different. They're completely individual. And one diabetic 
why they have diabetes might be related to some sort of like heavy metal overload and some like genetic predisposition that you could fix if you gave them enough like B vitamins and, and also maybe a chronic, you know, dysbiosis in their gut and a little bit of thyroid dysfunction. Okay. And the other diabetic, it might be because, um, they had a different, you know, um, chronic infection. Maybe they have, you know, something more of like a candida overload and they have, you know, stress and they have, you know, they're working too hard and they're, um, they're not doing enough to like, you know, balance out their autonomic nervous system. And, um, and there may be, you know, so, um, so I can't think right off the top of my head, you know, to make them completely different, but they're, but they're, but they are. So like everyone is completely individual and there's going to be some overlap. But, um, but the point here is that when you dig down with some of these functional medicine tests, you'll find different, um, different things wrong in different people. They, they might be missing a certain micronutrient, for example, in their diet. Um, and, and the other person might be fine on that micronutrient, but they're missing something else. And the end result of this like complex web of interactions in your body with, you know, in between you and the environment and your diet and, you know, infections that you developed years ago that are just kind of like really like, you know, in the background, they're not really, you know, affecting you acutely. It doesn't feel like it, but they're actually leading to the manifestation of something like diabetes. In the case of long COVID or vaccine injuries, um, we do have kind of an inciting cause that you can point to, right? The spike protein um, is triggering a lot of the inflammation, but it's why you, why did you get long COVID? Whereas the next person, your neighbor didn't, right? They also got exposed to the spike protein. Um, so that, that's where the functional medicine comes in. And we've talked about this with the health coaching program, you know, the lifestyle, you know, change program with Michelle a lot, trying to explain that, you know, everyone has certain like predispositions, right. Based on their kind of like biochemical, um, makeup, and their past and their level of stress and their, you know, lifestyle and their genetics and, you know, what their micronutrient kind of milieu internal environment looks like. Um, and so, so that interplay is going to be different with everyone. It's going to lead to different um, manifestations of long COVID in some people. There's a lot, again, there's a lot of overlap because we're all human beings. So we're far more similar than we are different at the end. Um, but some people will have specific manifestations of long COVID with nothing else, right? And it's like, this is still long COVID, but in you specifically, um, your kind of like body is reacting in this way because of your own specific history. And so the way that I treat long COVID is with kind of mostly relatively generic protocols. There are some, there's a lot, there's some fine tuning that goes on because we do some lab testing and we change some supplements here and there, and we might increase some or decrease some based on your lab testing. And we might add some actually based on certain labs that come back. Um, but overall, it's a pretty generic protocol and we're trying to focus on the inflammation caused by the spike protein um, and helping your body clear out the spike protein with autophagy inducers um, and clear up the microclotting that we're finding in everyone and helping to balance the autonomic nervous system in everyone. So it is a bit of a one size fits all approach with a little bit of wiggle room for individuality. Um, so, sorry, I <laughs> need to maybe mute my phone. Um, all right, so uh, let me just send a message. Uh, all right, so sorry, I got. <laughs> um, actually, I'll just put my phone on airplane. Um, got distracted. Sorry about that. Um, so, so with long COVID again, it is. Um, so the long COVID protocol has some elements of functional medicine, right? It's, it's kind of a. a somewhat generic functional medicine protocol. Um, but if you want to, if you want to dig deeper, right? So I think most people, at least 80% of people, maybe even more 90% will get better with this kind of trial and error approach that we have with, with long COVID. And we're always trying to push the bar with long COVID and make it more and more individualized and be able to hopefully it, one point be able to or one day be able to look at somebody and do some lab tests and figure out which medicine will work best for them specifically 
Um, at this point, we're not there yet. So it's still a lot of trial and error. It's like, okay, let's try this. This works in most people. And then if that doesn't work, let's try something else. Let's try ivermectin and then let's try hydroxychloroquine and low dose naltrexone and maybe an antibiotic uh, course for a week. And, and then maybe, you know, fluoxetine or fluvoxamine and maybe Pravastatin, maybe at some point Ravrock and et cetera, right? On down the list, going from like the heavy hitters, the ones that most often, you know, hit a home run for most people uh, down to the ones that might require a longer treatment or might have slightly higher risk of side effects or might be less of a, a heavy hitter, right? So less likely to, to work in more people, but might be likely to work in you. And um, so... That's the general approach for long COVID and vaccine injuries. Um, and so even when people have like long COVID and it triggers not only long COVID symptoms, but perhaps say diabetes um, or um, some like yesterday, somebody told me they were diagnosed with CDIP, um, chronic demyelinating inflammatory polyneuropathy, I, I think. Um, so uh, if there is a specific manifestation, even something severe after a vaccine, like a cancer or something, or, or suddenly you develop hypertension, um, this kind of, you could label it as a secondary illness. I would argue that it, it's just a manifestation in you specifically of long COVID or vaccine injury. And let's focus on trying to clear out the spike protein, get rid of the pathology that we know is triggered by the spike protein in long haulers. Let's just use what we know um, up front first uh, to try to fix that. And usually everything else will get fixed. All your long COVID symptoms will go away, your vaccine injury symptoms will go away, and your um, and that secondary kind of manifestation, if you want to call it that, like the high blood pressure or the high blood sugar or the CIDP or whatever else um, came up should also go away, right? And if uh, something like shingles sprouted up or Epstein-Barr virus reactivated or mold toxicity crept in or Lyme disease reactivated or flared up, that should also, you know, your body should be able to like put that back in the box, control it again, once you fix the spike protein issue. Um, so that works for most people. Most of the time, you just have to kind of like use the protocols we have for long COVID and within a few months, you know, it's all cleared up, you're done with long COVID and you're done with anything else that long COVID brought with it. Um, but there is a subset of people where like, okay, the long COVID seems to be pretty well taken care of, but I still have this new issue. I still have maybe the diabetes that was, we thought triggered by the long COVID, but it didn't go away. So at that point, you might want to broaden your efforts and bring in more of a functional medicine kind of approach where you do more advanced testing. So we, we do do some basic testing. Um, you might even call it, you know, somewhat advanced testing, but from local labs, right? Testing that's widely available is what we recommend for most long haulers and vaccine injury patients that you can just go down to your local lab and get these tests. The interpretation is more advanced than what you'll get at your regular physician's office. Um, and the the ranges that we're looking at, we're looking at more optimal ranges versus just like normal ranges. Um, and uh, and so it's a more advanced kind of interpretation of those regular lab tests than you'll usually get. Um, but but the tests themselves, um, you know, there's a limit to what you can get at a local lab. And so there is some, you know, um, in some cases you might need more advanced testing. And and so there are so many functional medicine specialized labs that do advanced stool testing. So you go to your local lab and you get a stool test. And it's looking at like, you know, 0.1% of what it could look for in your gut. Um, it's just looking for some common infections, for example, um, and some maybe, maybe some common parasites. And, and a more advanced functional medicine stool testing would look at a far broader set of, you know, your gut bacteria and possible, you know, chronic infections that are lurking in there. Small intestinal bacterial overgrowth can be checked for, gut dysbiosis of various kinds, um, and they can sequence uh, the DNA, you know, the genetics of the stuff that's in your stool instead of just trying to grow it, which is oftentimes very difficult. You know, you take stool out of somebody, the, the bacteria grow very well in their, in, in their natural environment, which is your gut, but you take that stuff out of your gut, you take the stool out of your gut in a sample and try to grow it in a lab, it, sometimes it's more difficult. And sometimes you can't grow the thing that's harming the person and you can't even find it. 
um, out, you know, in a lab. But if you sequence the the genome of the stool and, and you know, it's far easier to find because even if it's dead and it's not growing, you'll still find the genetic imprint. You'll feel, still find its genes in the stool. So that's just one example of, you know, uh, what I would call an advanced functional medicine, you know, testing or advanced functional lab. Um, and there's other ones too. Um, there, there's a whole um, list of different, um, you know, tests that aren't commonly run at a local laboratory that oftentimes you'll have to send off a sample to a specialized laboratory um, to get it done. And so I, I don't like to recommend these right away for people because I don't think it's um, absolutely necessary and I don't think most people will need them. You know, it's an extra expense, obviously. But some people um, who, who've gone through the functional medicine or through the protocols for long COVID vaccine injuries still need some extra help at the end. And, and if you're at a loss of what to do, um, you might want to, you know, you can still go down the trial and error pathway, but at some point you might decide that, hey, I'd like to do some more testing to see if there's something missing here, right? Do I have some genetic predisposition that makes me need more, you know, methylators or something, right? Like a, I have a methylation abnormality or do I have, um, you know, a chronic illness like or, or chronic infection, right? Like a gut dysbiosis, like a specific kind of chronic gut infection that is not so severe that it's causing like persistent diarrhea or constipation, but it's affecting the rest of my body and creating this inflammation that's manifesting as some illness, right? That's outside the gut. So um, do I have uh, food allergies? Do I have, um, you know, like something like Lyme disease or a co-infection of Lyme disease? Do I have heavy metal toxicity? A lot of people do and they don't know it. And some people it's just from their diet, right? So it's they're eating too much of a, you know, tuna or they're, um, you know, one patient recently uh, was in college and had one of a heavy metal elevated um, that we thought might be due to like old pipes, right? Because this was like a school that was hundreds of years old and she was drinking tap water. Um, I mean, it's possible that some of those pipes, and, and it wasn't like lead, you know, I, you know, obviously they have addressed that. It was copper. So, um, you know, in the old world, we did use copper for piping sometimes. Um, and it was a great anti like bacterial metal to use for, for water piping. But in a particular person, um, you may end up with too much copper, especially if you're taking a copper supplement at the same time. So Oftentimes, if people are taking zinc supplements, they supplement with copper as well. Uh, but if you've got copper piping or you're cooking in like copper cookware, you know, not most people don't, but some people do, um, you may end up with too much copper. So, you know, a little thing like that can throw your body out of whack um, in the setting of other a bunch of other things that are out of whack as well. Um, so there, there are these kind of like, you know, house MD kind of like, you know, um, things that we can dig up and find. Uh, with advanced functional medicine testing and somebody who has more experience with it. So I, I've been trained in functional medicine myself, um, but I haven't had a lot of experience outside of treating long COVID and vaccine injuries with the functional medicine approach to treating chronic illness. You know, So that's why I wanted to bring on Dr. William Shelton, and we'll be introducing him on Tuesday, um, to, to help to kind of work hand in hand with me to um, help me with people, whether or not they have long COVID or vaccine injury, or they might just have a chronic illness like diabetes or low testosterone or whatever they want help with, um, or maybe like menopausal symptoms or whatever, if they want like a, a real medicine, functional medicine, you know, approach. And that, you know, I say real medicine because it, it's kind of just like what medicine should be, right? You know, the way house practices medicine is the way you should practice medicine, right? Like you should keep your eyes open and not just like, you know, okay, everyone, you know, who walks in, you know, oh, you got pneumonia, you got diabetes, here's some insulin, here's some this, here's some that. Uh, let's try to figure out what the root cause is and fix it. Let's try to cure you, right? Let's try to try to fix you. Um, and, and people, they don't, I think there's a limiting belief that you can't cure these chronic illnesses. Like you can't cure diabetes. You can't cure the heart disease. You can just manage it you know, for the rest of your life. That's a pharmaceutical paradigm. That's like a mainstream medical paradigm where you're just a customer for life. I'm here to tell you that you can cure yourself. You can heal yourself. Um, you know, hopefully the FDA doesn't jump down my throat for saying that, but it's true. You know, I got to tell you that people can heal. I've seen people reverse, you know, decades of chronic illness with weeks of lifestyle change when it's, you know, when it's extreme enough, you know, most people aren't willing to go that extreme, but 
you know, people, you know, oftentimes see on social media and it's true that like, okay, I went full carnivore and within two weeks, my chronic arthritis that I'd had for 50 years disappeared, you know? Yeah. You can see it on the x-ray and it's bone on bone and now it doesn't hurt anymore. <laughs> What's to, what explains that? Um, you know, it's inflammation. The inflammation is gone. The, the pain was from inflammation. And it's, you know, the, the story that you're being told that you're believing that it's bone on bone, there's no way it could possibly stop hurting without a joint replacement. It's not true. It's just not true. Um, or like my back pain is because of a slip disc or whatever it is. It's not necessarily true. It's a limiting belief. And it's like, a, you got to you gotta toss out the belief that's keeping you sick and in pain. And I mentioned in, in my live stream yesterday that I had had this chronic ankle pain for years literally. And I just like, I thought, okay, I've sprained my ankle like 20 times in my life. Like it's just a weak ankle. It's just going to hurt now unless I don't know what I have to do to fix it. You know, maybe I need to go to physical therapy or maybe I need to like, maybe there's some tight muscles that I need to, you know, get massaged out or something and whatever, you know, I was, or, you know, I need to like, it's, it's like slipped a little bit. And because of how lax the joint is, it's just going to be painful. Right. And one day I just thought, you know, maybe all of that is not true. Maybe that's just like a story I'm telling myself and it's like the pain is up here really <clears throat> feels like it's down there, but it's coming from up here. It's coming from this story <clears throat> and this belief. And, and from that day on, I have not had ankle pain. I mean, it was just incredible. I, I, I was reading about this, you know, tension myositis syndrome and <clears throat> John Sarno's approach to back pain. And it's generalizable really to all pain. It, it doesn't, it's not just for back pain, but the idea is that, you know, this, you know, for back pain, it, it might be like a spasm or something that your, your actual, your mind is actually creating in the back, causing the pain. Um, and, and there's these inconvenient truths, right. In, in some of these issues, in some of these disorders like back pain, where you'll take like, you know, a sample of hundred people and like, they all have the same abnormality on their back MRI or their back X-ray. And like 10% of them have back pain and 90% of them don't. And you're telling the 10% that has back pain, you're, it looks like the back pain must be from this slip disc or this pinched nerve or this whatever, right? That's what's causing it. What about the 90 other people who have the exact same picture on their MRI and they don't have back pain? So, so like, how can you say it's that in for sure in the 10%, it's this, um, it's this, uh, um, you know, uh, kind of like logical fallacy in, um, in mainstream medicine that, um, we attribute, you know, the disease to, to the abnormality we can find and that we can see. So we run all the, the whole battery of tests that we have. And whatever comes up abnormal, that must be what's causing your disease. And it's like the person who's searching for their lost key under the street lamp, and you ask them, "Why are you looking here?" And you're like, "And they're like, this is where the light is." <laughs> it's not a good reason, right? That's literally the way mainstream medicine operates. They're looking where the light is, and they're not looking outside that cone of light, outside the light cone. But you know, hey, pull out a flashlight and go looking every go look where you think you dropped the key, right? That's where you're probably gonna find it, not where the light is. It happens to be from this street lamp. Um, and so so unfortunately, you know, when people with long code and vaccine injuries go into a like a mainstream doctor's office, they'll run all the tests that they have available, you know, that they know of and that they can easily order, and they'll say, Okay, there's nothing wrong here, so there's nothing wrong with you. It must be in your head. That's the that's this that's the only other option that they'll give you is like, well, you might you'll have to go to psychiatry, right? Because you must be crazy. And and I know that I'm kind of saying that that might actually be the case. <laughs> I'm not saying that you're crazy, but sometimes the pain or the illness is related to a belief, and it's like subconscious, and you can address it yourself by changing that belief. And, and there's methods to doing that, um, but sometimes there's also a physical you know, issue, right? So, so it's not always just in your head. Um, that ankle pain could have theoretically been due to something else. Um, but the mind over matter thing is so powerful that even if there is something else causing the pain or the, or the manifestation of the disease, sometimes your mind can still overcome that and you can heal if you change the belief, right? If you, if you change, um, if you just, uh, if you just start to think and you really become convinced that, Hey, um, it's hurting just because I think it should hurt, 
right? <laughs> um, you know, I've convinced myself that there's a story for why it hurts. And like, and this is why people get stuck in this kind of like vicious cycle. When they go to the doctor, they become convinced with a paradigm or like a worldview or a story for their pain or for their illness. They, they get wrapped up in this explanation of, okay, this is why you have back pain. This is why you have PCOS. This is why you have hypertension. You know, you have this worldview of ours and this story that we're telling you and convincing you of, and then you carry that with you to the end of your life and you never get rid of it uh, because you think you can't. Um, so if you change that worldview to a, a different one that doesn't have any limiting beliefs in it, where you open up the door to, I can heal and I can, you know, cure myself, um, then you can, <laughs> you know, that, that's the point that, um, we have to start from the philosophical standpoint of any disease can be cured. Okay. That's my starting point. Um, and it's, you could call it a religious belief or just a philosophical approach to medicine. I mean, otherwise, what are we doing here as physicians, right? What is the purpose of medicine? If you don't start from that, if you don't start from the assumption that I can fix this, why are you a doctor anyway? Right. Um, you're, you're not supposed to just be a pill pusher. That's what a lot of us have become just, you know, pushing pills and, you know, putting people on a subscription plan for the rest of their lives of, you know, insulin injections or whatever it is, or, you know, in some cases <laughs> with COVID, it seems like you're on a mRNA vax subscription program um, at this point in time, you know, HHS health and human services, you know, department of health and human services, it seemed was literally recommending vaccines now every four months for COVID. Um, so three times a year vaccines for the rest of your life. Right. Um, so, um, so let's get back to kind of like uh, go down these rabbit holes sometimes, um, you know, so functional medicine, um, you know, who is it good for, right? Like, I think that it's really useful for people, especially who've had like a chronic illness and they've tried a lot of different things. Um, how does functional medicine, and, and it can be useful, you, you could choose to do it right from the start, you know, um, with long COVID and the vaccine injury protocol, we could also dig into like some advanced labs and stuff. And, and we could, you know, maybe tweak the protocol a lot more than we uh, would otherwise be able to once we get some of those results back. Um, or you could do it um, after trying the protocols for long COVID or vaccine injury and kind of get to the end and, you know, there's some sticky symptoms that are hard to get rid of or some issues that are really hard for us to get rid of. Then we want to dig down deeper and try to figure out, is there something there that we can, um, you know, add or take away or fix that'll solve the, the last 10% of the issues. Um, you know, we fix 90% of it. Let's fix the last 10%. Um, or you don't have long COVID and vaccine injuries. You have something else. You have like a chronic, like maybe you have chronic fatigue or you have um, fibromyalgia or you have, you know, it, it could be literally anything. You have any chronic medical issue or just like a constellation of symptoms, right? Like most people who think they're healthy, if they fill out like a functional medicine questionnaire, <laughs> like a symptom questionnaire for functional medicine and like a, there's these symptom scoring questionnaires that we give out sometimes where it's like, okay, fill these up and you get a score like out of a hundred for like how sick you are. Um, you would, you may be shocked, right? Like things that you have just learned to put up with, like a little bit of reflux and a little bit of like, you know, hemorrhoids and constipation and, um, you know, a little bit of, you know, stomach upset every once in a while and some stomach pain sometimes when I eat this or that. And, uh, and, uh, you know, some headaches, you know, another frequent one and, you know, maybe my scalp itches, you know, frequently and dandruff and, uh, you know, runny nose and, you know, a little bit of like scratchy throat sometimes. And, um, you know, all of these things, these are not normal, right? And allergies and, you know, all of these things can be fixed, right? Um, you can go back to optimal functioning, right? Like, you know, you were aiming for optimal health for the longest period of time. So like a health span that coincides with a long lifespan and is nearly as long as the lifespan, right? So I don't just want people to live for 100 years or 80 years or 90 years or whatever it is. Um, I want them to be healthy for that period of time. Whereas nowadays, you know, unfortunately with the pandemic, our life expectancy has actually dropped, I think, three or four years. I mean, it's like really extremely concerning. Um, but 
you know, say it's 74, 75 now, and in other countries, it's 85 uh, on average. Um, but the problem is, you know, some of our ancestors in the last, you know, four or 500 years, maybe they were living only to like 45, 50 um, on average. And now we're living, you know, an extra 20 years on average. But for a lot of us, that extra 20 years is 20 years of being debilitated in a nursing home. Right. So that's not what you want. Right. Like most people would rather not live like that in the last 20 years of the life. Um, so if you're going to live to 90, you don't want to live from 70 to 90 in a nursing home, barely able to get out of bed. Um, you'd like to live up to 90, you know, leading a vibrant life, you know, having fun and playing tennis and, you know, enjoying your great, great grandkids. Um, and so so that's what we're talking about with health span. We're trying to maximize our health span. And if you're, you know, 30, 40, 50, 60 years old, and you've got all these aches and pains and headaches and, you know, constipation and reflux, you're heading for a fall too soon, right? Like you should still be vibrantly healthy. You know, even if you're 80 or 90, you should be vibrantly healthy. You shouldn't be like searching for words, you know, like uh, you shouldn't be, um, you know, uh, forgetting things all the time, forgetting where your keys are. You shouldn't be um, feeling like, a little bit brain foggy. You shouldn't be having all these little symptoms. You should be healthy, right? The way you felt in your teens or your twenties, hopefully, you know, maybe some people were even unhealthy back then, but you should feel energy. You should wake up ready to go and you should feel like, you know, you love what you do and you have lots of energy and enthusiasm and, um, ability to focus. That's a big one for a lot of people. Can you focus properly? Uh, so, so all of that. So that's what we're aiming for with functional medicine is to help people. And so, so it may just be that, that you have, that you feel suboptimally healthy and you want to optimize your health and you've tried some things yourself. You've tried changing your diet and you've tried exercising. You've tried, you know, getting out in the sun and you've tried sleeping well and, and you're still not getting anywhere and you've tried some supplements and you need some help. So that, that's where functional medicine can come along also for some people. Uh, so those are the people who generally, you know, benefit. Uh, the people who get the most benefit are the ones who are the most sick, obviously, because there's the, the most improvement you can make for those people. But even the people who don't consider themselves sick, when they see how, when they finally do wake up and realize how much better they feel after going through a functional medicine kind of workup and, you know, some changes to their lifestyle and supplement regimen, and maybe even some medications that you need to take for a short period of time to get rid of something that's affecting you. Um, once they get to the end of that road, they may realize there is actually a night and day difference and they had just gotten used to being, you know, 50% of what they should have been or 70% or 80%, right? If Even if you're running at 80% for 20 years, compare that to running at 100% for 20 years, not only are you going to get a lot more done, but you're going to feel a lot better, right? Your um, sat life satisfaction is going to go up a number of notches. And so, so, so that's the goal here. Um, what else did I want to talk about? Uh, so I, I guess, you know, I guess I can check to see if there's any questions about this now. Um, so like, what, what do people want to know? Like who benefits from it? What is it? Okay. Yeah. So I did want to mention that I personally think maybe as much as 90% of the benefit of functional medicine really just boils down to cleaning up your diet and your lifestyle. And lifestyle means not just what you eat. Okay. It means what you think. It means um, your belief system. Um, it means uh, how you sleep and how much you sleep, how much time you spent with other people, you know, quality time, how much time you spend on social media, you know, how much time you spend on the computer. Um, you know, you have to limit that in order to have like an optimally healthy, you know, uh, life. Um, how much time you spend in the sun, how much time you spend exercising and what kind of exercise you do, what you eat and when you eat um, and how you eat. And, um, and so, so all of these things fall under the rubric of lifestyle as well as, you know, um, and what else can we say? Um, you know, social connection, how much time you spend in nature, um, you know, how connected you are, you know, grounding is part of it, right? You need to be in touch with, with the earth sometimes because of the magnetic kind of, there's a magnetic discharge that happens. Um, and so, 
uh, you know, how much blue light you get at what times of day. Um, so, so there's a, a really a lot to living a healthy lifestyle. Maybe for some people, EMF, you know, limiting EMF exposures and um, whether or not you choose to get vaccinated. Um, and if you do choose to get vaccinated, how you get vaccinated, maybe spacing them out and how they're actually administered, you know, with a slow push or with a fast push. Um, so there's all these subtleties, right, to lifestyle and the choices that you make that can have a huge impact on your health. So if you, like most people, I think, can get 90 to 100% of the benefit um, of functional medicine just by focusing on their lifestyle with a health coach like Michelle Harvey, uh, coach.mygotodoc.com. Um, but in my experience, what I found is that even though that is the case, it's hard to convince people <laughs> to change their lifestyle drastically enough to get them 100%, you know, optimally healthy. It can be done. It is possible, but whether or not you will do it is the question. So in some cases, people who have very, very limited funds, right? Like they can't afford to fix themselves with mainstream medicine or, or really any medicine, um, I've found that they are the most motivated. So like extremely poor people in, you know, some uh, in, in the Middle East, uh, and I was in Jordan for a while, and some pe you know, people have heard me talk about this before. I worked with a friend of mine named Shabazz who um, basically kind of specializes almost in like end stage cancer patients from like villages in the middle of nowhere who like are told that, you know, you have to come up with $200,000 from your friends and family in order to like go for a surgery and chemotherapy for your, you know, your mom who has, you know, end stage uterine cancer. And they're like, this is not possible. <laughs> you know? um, and then they hear, you know, from somebody who's been cured by, you know, Shabazz that, hey, there's this guy in Jordan that you can call up on WhatsApp and, you know, he'll tell you what to do and fix your cancer. Um, and so, he didn't used to do that when I first knew him and, and he kind of like became that over time. And I was there for that kind of like progression from, you know, this is somebody who just kind of is interested in health and, you know, knows a bit about being healthy himself and has gotten himself healthy with lifestyle change to becoming this like guru that's kind of like known around the world in, you know, in these circles as somebody who can cure incurable di diseases. Um, and so, so I was part of that kind of like transformation because I was, you know, what happened was that there was this elderly, you know, individual who was very well trusted in the community where we were living in our neighborhood um, who, so Shabazz kind of brought me in and he was like, can you, I know that you know about functional medicine and, you know, lifestyle and diet and everything. Can you counsel this guy um, on, um, you know, how to change his diet and lifestyle so that we can so he doesn't have to go for a stent, a cardiac stent. And so I sat with him and we sat there for an hour with another um, friend of his. So uh, kind of this trusted elder in the community, Shabazz and myself, were kind of doing an intervention with a friend of that elder, right? So this elderly gentleman in the community, he had a friend who had heart disease and that person didn't want to go for a cardiac cath and a stent. And so we were like, well, let's try to convince him to change his diet and lifestyle. Let's and so, so we did, we did that. And within a couple of weeks, his um, heart symptoms were gone and he felt, he basically threw away his heart medication. I didn't tell him to do that, but he did. Um, and, and he had no more issues. I mean, he had gotten to the point where he couldn't walk, you know, more than like 10 minutes. And then he started going for walks for hours. And, and it happened literally within two or three weeks. Um, which sounds impossible. <laughs> Again, there's a matter of limiting beliefs and how you're holding yourself back with your lifestyle. And so we just transformed his diet. We got rid of the, you know, the seed oils, you know, the canola oil that he was cooking with and got rid of the, you know, he was probably had a lot of information from wheat, um, unfortunately. And we took that out and we added in some juicing and we just like pumped him with micronutrients from vegetable juices, you know, and, uh, and his health was transformed. And then, you know, that elderly, um, you know, that elderly gentleman in the community who was um, kind of like what they call a sheikh over there, you know, like a, a wise man, essentially, who um, he saw this happen with his friend with heart disease. And 
it lit a fire under him. He was like, we have to tell everyone I know in this country, right? So we spent the next six months driving all over the Jordan to like far flung villages and like sitting there with, you know, friends of this elderly gentleman's. Uh, his name is Abu Munir. Um, he actually ended up publishing a book <laughs> that was translated. It's available on Amazon. Um, so on, on like diet, essentially, like, like fix your chronic disease by changing your diet. Uh, you know, he grabbed me and he took Shabazz and Shabazz was kind of the translator in the beginning. And I was the person that, you know, I didn't know Arabic and I was just like telling people, okay, like this is why um, all these medications are probably bad for you. Right? <laughs> Um, and so Shabazz was translating, Abu Munir was taking us. And so we were running these interventions all over Jordan and telling people drastically change your lifestyle, you know, go from eating like white rice and bread and, you know, cooking with canola oil, um, to, to throwing out the white rice and throwing out the bread and, you know, eating, you know, a, a, a far different diet than they had been used to for at least you know, two or three generations, at least for a hundred years, uh, once they had become westernized. And in time and again, we saw people who had, you know, one person had severe arthritis, um, you know, a, time and again, they would come off their medications within a couple of weeks and their symptoms would be gone again, or 90% better and then gone within weeks to a month. And, and these people were, um, their lives were transformed. And I tried to understand how this was possible because I had, tried to bring this message to people myself and it hadn't worked, right? Um, and so I think that intervention format where you have like multiple people involved and you sit down with them and you really explain it and dig into the details for at least an hour, right? It, we would go and sit there for at least an hour. That was part of it. Another part of it was like, oftentimes we would bring a juicer and be like, here, here, here's a juicer, right? And here's some vegetables, get started, start juicing, you know? Um, or we would get, bring them some sorghum, um, you know, uh, flour to replace their whole wheat flour or their white flour or their white bread. Um, here, try cooking with this and take out the inflammatory wheat from your diet. Um, and so like giving people a gift kind of gets them invested a little bit. So that was an aspect or an element of it. Um, and then having like different viewpoints, like there was me and there was Shabazz and, you know, he had kind of like an Ayurvedic background and viewpoint. And I was, you know, a Western trained doctor that people kind of, you know, trust, you know, in the modern world. And, um, and maybe also because I was an American. Um, and then there was this elder community or elder elderly gentleman that was kind of like the wise man of the community that they trusted and who was presenting this to them. So all of those elements made it really powerful for people. It really convinced the people that we sat down with to drastically change their lifestyle. So if there's a way to do that for somebody, I think that that is enough on its own for the body to completely heal from anything. Um, after leaving that environment, Jordan, and, and that kind of like perfect mix of ingredients, um, I've been hoping or praying or trying to recreate that. How do you recreate that? Um, and so, for example, how do you recreate it in, online, right? You know, I, all my patients are online now. Um, so, so you try to give away a free gift or something, right? Um, obviously, I mean, everyone does that online. It's not as like compelling as like a physical thing where you go to the person's house and give them something. Uh, but sure, okay, it's still a free gift. Um, you try to create content and you try to sit with them for, you know, in the content, you can sit and listen to me for hours, right? Um, on different content platforms and you try to convince them, right? And so we're doing this stuff with Michelle Harvey where we're trying to talk about lifestyle. Um, and, and that's what I'm doing right now too. Um, and, and you try to get them to change their belief that like, Hey, if, if you can really believe deep down that if you do all this stuff, you'll be completely cured within, you know, a very short period of time, you're going to be more likely or more willing to do it. If you're not fully convinced, you're going to be less likely to do it. Right. So if I tell you that you have to completely change everything you eat and juice two times a day and, you know, sleep, you know, eight hours a day and, and all these things, right. And get out and get in the sun and get off of social media and restrict, restrict your time on social media to like an hour and like only use it on the computer or whatever, right. All these rules, right. That feel like a whole job on their own. If you have like end stage cancer and you have no other option, maybe you'll be willing to do that. And you'll find out that like your cancer starts to vanish within weeks and you're better and you feel better than you've ever felt in your life within a month. 
Um, so, so it's a matter of like deeply instilling that like belief to the point where it's a certainty in your mind that if I do this, I will be cured. Um, and so if you can trigger that in somebody, then you can cure them because you get them to fully invest and do it themselves, right? Like I can fix myself. So my purpose with spending, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 minutes on this is to say that it is possible to heal without spending a lot of money, right? You don't have to give me thousands of dollars or a functional medicine doc doctor thousands of dollars and a functional medicine lab, you know, thousands of dollars to get to the bottom of why you're sick and fix yourself. Most of the power of the, like a functional approach to medicine is in what you do yourself. And sometimes the journey to getting to doing all of those things requires you spending money. Okay. So for somebody who's getting by on like a dollar a day, um, their investment of money, right? Like they may just have to invest 10 bucks in something before it convinces them to change, drastically change their lifestyle. For somebody who's getting by on, I don't know, maybe 30,000 a year or, you know, 100,000 a year. I don't know where people are, but, you know, people are all over the place, right? Um, some people are going to be in the upper quartiles of, you know, um, income and the upper deciles and even the upper, you know, you know, few percentiles of income and other people are going to be lower down. But um, a lot of us, it takes more to convince us, right? And, and we have to become monetarily invested before we fully become like deeply invested and dive in. And so sometimes this process of like, okay, let's pay a doctor and talk to them and they tell me something and then let's go and get some tests done. And, and then I see some proof that, okay, I do have a problem with wheat. You've convinced me now, now I'm going to go change my diet and, and take it out. Um, sometimes I can't just tell people to do that. And they like, I'll tell them and they just don't accept it. And they have to spend some money and time and, go down a certain path before they get to the point where they make those changes that actually lead to health. Um, so, so the process of functional medicine workup and consults and, you know, recommendations and everything, a lot of that process is getting people led down the path of lifestyle change and making it possible for them to change their lifestyle step by step and convincing them deeply that it needs to be done. Um, <clears throat> and there's also like, Maybe you don't need to, maybe there's, you know, you could dramatically change your lifestyle and fix everything, or maybe you could less dramatically change your lifestyle and still fix everything by doing functional medicine and finding a couple of really strong and important levers that you can pull, right? Like take this medication, this antibiotic, this, um, you know, supplement, you know, this, you know, thing to boost your hormones or something based on what we found in the labs. And that makes it easier for you. It's possible that we do it that way too. And so you, you meet people where they're at, essentially, is what I'm saying. That if you're not willing to change everything in your life to get healthy, and maybe it's not possible, maybe you can't give up the, a certain job that you know messes up your sleep patterns and gives you a lot of stress, and maybe you just don't feel like you have the headspace or the time to meditate and learn Qigong and you know do these other things that are being recommended. Um, Maybe all you're willing to do is pop a pill and some supplements and functional medicine can fix you that way too, right? Oftentimes. I do still think that you're going to have to change some things in your lifestyle most of the time for most people. Sometimes you can, you know, literally you feel like you're in a house episode and you find something in that functional medicine workup that's really kind of like the silver bullet that gets rid of the illness without the person having to make a lot of changes. Um, so I know that it's been a little bit confusing and I'm a little bit all over the place here, but um, I hope I'm trying, I'm kind of getting across the point that I'm trying to make that, uh, <clears throat> sorry, I got to check my schedule make sure. Okay. Yeah. So I do have a little bit more time. So I know we're going over, but we started late. Um, so, so my point is that people, you know, come to this from all different perspectives and walks of life and, um, people are willing to do all the different kinds of things. And so we can find a way, you know, we can benefit people no matter what they're willing to do with a functional medicine approach. Um, I think my main point was just that I don't like to tell, I don't want to leave people feeling as though you have to spend hundreds or thousands of dollars to get healthy. That's not my message. You don't have to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to get healthy. 
you don't need to buy a lot of supplements. You don't need to buy a lot of devices to get healthy, right? Um, that is one way of getting healthy, okay? <laughs> and some people are only willing to do that to get healthy. Other people are willing to drastically change their lifestyle. If, if you have no funding, if you have no funds, and you're just willing to follow to the T everything that I tell you to do, I think that we can get you healthy with just what's available in your grocery store and in your kitchen, okay? Um, but you got to choose to buy different things from the grocery, grocery store and maybe buy a blender, okay? Um, so, and, and, and learn to prepare foods in different ways and maybe get some bone broth going in your kitchen and, you know, you're going to have to buy different things. Um, and buy better quality food sometimes. And, and so, yeah, I mean, you're going to have to spend some money on the food, but you're, you're going to, you could just switch from buying what you're buying to buying something else and maybe even keep the budget the same. And so with working within people's limitations, it's possible to heal them, right? So, so most of the people in Jordan that we, um, completely transformed their health, they were like dirt poor. Okay. <laughs> they did not have the money to buy supplements or to buy like, you know, grass fed organic food or something, you know, they were just going to the local grocery. I mean, the, the quality of food in Jordan is like pretty, pretty bad, right? Like pesticides, all kinds of things. Right. So you, you look at the dirty dozen and at least you get the dirty dozen, you know, foods out and, you know, throw those out and choose other vegetables. So, you know, you're not going to be eating the pesticide, you know, stuffed strawberries that are, you know, um, because they're like a pesticide bomb, right? Like that thin skin just soaks up the pesticides. You know? uh, it's horrifying. Um, so, so you look at the dirty dozen and get those out. If you can't buy organic, at least don't buy those. Or if you're going to buy, if you're going to buy organic on a limited budget, devote the organic portion of the budget to the dirty dozen foods that have the most pesticides in them. And you can find that online. Um, so my point here, again, that I'm probably belaboring, uh, it, you know, right now is that no matter what budget you're on, no matter what you're willing to do, we can find a way to help you. Um, if you, if your approach is, okay, I want to spend some money and I want to do some labs, functional medicine, you know, our functional medicine consultant and our functional medicine offering is probably a great fit. Um, it's available to people online and, and you can do it from the comfort of your home. <laughs> so uh, let me see if there's any questions now. Got to find where, okay. Uh, you mentioned reversing diabetes, only type two. Yeah, so this is a, a good one. Um, I think that, you know, Chris Kresser, he's a functional medicine doctor. Uh, he has a great website with a lot of resources. He has a blog post on type one diabetes and the possibility of reversing that. So I personally think anything can be cured and it's just that not every patient can be cured because they're not willing to do or patient enough to stick with you until you figure out how to fix them. Um, but yeah, the, the philosophical, like the belief system I have is that we can fix anything. Um, and, and, you know, in some cases that's going to seem kind of incredible, um, to people, but, but I do believe that, that it, it is possible to, to fix type one diabetes, but it may be hard. It's, it's probably going to be harder. So there are some things that are harder to fix and it may take a lot longer to fix. Right. So if you tell somebody that, the journey ahead of you is going to be a 10 year journey, you know, of dramatically changing your lifestyle and spending some money looking for like underlying issues and, you know, um, doing this workup and tweaking this and tweaking that, um, you know, who's willing to do that? Few people are, but is it possible? Yes, I think it is possible. Uh, and so it's not type two is far easier to fix than type one. Um, and, uh, but I think type one is possible to fix. I, so, so yeah, to, that, to answer your question, um, this would be considered like heresy. Okay. It is, I think, considered heresy and the mainstream, you know, if you go to a mainstream endocrinologist or, or, you know, diabetologist or just a PCP, they'd be like, there's no way you're fixing type one diabetes. You need insulin for the rest of your life. Uh, but I do think that the body can heal itself from anything from any point. Right. So, um, 
you still have stem cells, okay, in every tissue. And so we used to believe that there were no stem cells in the brain. There are stem cells in the brain. We used to believe that the heart can't remodel and regrow, but it can, right? Same for the pancreas. <laughs> you know, there are stem cells in the pancreas. You can regrow your pancreas. Um, so, so it is possible. Um, it's not, it might not be likely because, you know, you just might not have the resources or the understanding or the knowledge or the, the person to help you or the belief in place or the patience to go through it. Right. But possible. Yes, possible. Donnie says my 20 year old girlfriend has ulcerative colitis. This is probably one of those easy, you know, that you go to a mainstream physician and they're going to leave you thinking that this is like, you're never going to fix this. It's an incurable illness. You're just going to be living with it for the rest of your life. Um, this is probably one of the easier things to fix with a functional medicine approach. I mean, you might only need an autoimmune paleo diet to fix ulcerative colitis. I mean, there was one study, you know, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's, Crohn's disease, very similar um, illnesses. There are autoimmune diseases and um, a lot of people, and, and there was even a study showing that within six weeks, I think the vast majority of people in the study, all their symptoms were gone just by switching to an autoimmune paleo diet, right? Just changing your diet got rid of the symptoms of, of ulcerative colitis within six weeks. Um, this is unheard of in, in mainstream medicine. Um, so, so ulcerative colitis is probably one of the easiest things to fix. And, um, you know, first, so like you may not have to be on the autoimmune paleo diet for the rest of your life. You may need to be on it for a couple of years, right, to really deep down heal the gut. <clears throat> so the symptoms may be gone within six weeks, but the inflammation is still there. And it's, it's a lot like long COVID in that sense that I tell people, okay, you've taken the medications for a couple of weeks or, you know, a couple of months and you've gotten better, but you're not completely better yet. We got to overshoot the mark. We got to keep going with the protocol for a few more months before we try to start withdrawing it. The same with you know, in a functional medicine paradigm, most doctors will tell, tell patients, we need at least one month for every year you've been sick, minimum, at least, okay? Um, that's not like the maximum, but it's it, the minimum in terms of setting expectations. If you've been sick for 10 years, at least give us 10 months, okay, of changing your diet lifestyle and doing some supplements and maybe, you know, adding some medications and doing some labs. Um, once we find the and that's once we find the protocol that gets you better, 10 months, okay, after you've actually gotten better, not give us 10 months to get you better. Once we figure out how to get you better, give us 10 months on that protocol, okay, to really heal the underlying issue. And for some people, it's going to be, you know, double that or maybe triple that. Uh, so with ulcerative colitis, if you've had it like clinically manifested for 10 years, you might need to be on that diet for 10 months and then start to consider trying to taper off of it, you also might need to be on it for a couple of years. Uh, so, so there's no, I, I can't tell you beforehand um, how long it's going to take, but the, the ultimate purpose is to get you back to like normal. So you don't have to be on kind of like a weird off kilter diet for the rest of your life. Although for most people, I would recommend getting off of some of these Franken foods, these Frankenstein foods like modern wheat. Um, if you are good, and some people may, you know, there may be some caveats involved, right? So you may be able to eat ancestral wheat varieties if they're prepared, you know, by hand in a sourdough method, right? Um, so given all those caveats, yeah, you can have wheat, but who's going to go to the trouble of doing that? Very few people. So, so essentially, a lot of people are by default going to not be eating wheat because they can't eat the stuff that's in the store that's easy to buy and from their local bakery. Um, could they eat wheat? Theoretically, yes. Uh, but they would have to get maybe einkorn or spelt and they would have to like sit there, you know, kneading it for two days and before it's ready to bake into a proper, you know, homemade sourdough loaf. Then you can eat it in a healthy way. <laughs> um, some people may not be able to eat wheat. So, so there are some, you know, people who have ancestors who, uh, didn't evolve along with wheat, you know, and so so there are some people who have some genetic predispositions that make it very difficult to eat wheat. But you know, the tip, the typical one, um, you know, there are people who have celiac disease, which is in the modern world, you know, in modern mainstream medicine, considered to be like you just can never eat wheat again. 
actually, that's not actually true for a lot of celiac patients. They can actually eat a properly prepared sourdough loaf and not develop inflammation and see that once they've healed. Um, so hopefully that gives you some understanding. <laughs> Again, I kind of get uh, da down into the weeds and down a rabbit hole sometimes with these answers. Um, Marissa says, what can I use for inflammation in the gut? Yeah, so so you got to look at your diet. You know, that, that's important. And you got to look at your autonomic nervous system um, from a higher, like 20,000 foot overview level. Um, diet and and autonomic nervous system those are probably the two most important things so what you put into your gut and and your sympathetic nervous system how it's affecting your gut are, are the two most important things to decrease inflammation so you do things to balance the sympathetic nervous system and you um, look for inflammatory foods and then there are there are a number of supplements that are good for healing the gut lining and all that but it's kind of a generic question hard to answer um, with a spe with any specifics um, when the when I don't have the background, Donnie says, "What is the healthiest cooking oil?" Um, I already told her about Michelle and sent the episode about the healthy fats. This is a message from Julia. Yeah, so um, that's a great question. I, I would say get rid of you know in, in in it, but it depends on the situation and how hot the cooking is. You know, so how hot the pan is. If very very high heat, um, you know, you're going to want to use a high smoke point oil. Um, and for moderate heat, maybe, a, you know, an olive oil might be okay. Um, but, but it depends on the heat of the cooking. So, so yeah, I think Julia sent you the episode on healthy fats, uh, that Michelle put together. And I think that's the best place to go to look for that. So there's, there's, there's not just one answer. Um, it depends on the, the heat that you're using while you're cooking. David says, uh, and, and like extra virgin olive oil is probably best as a salad dressing oil. Um, it doesn't have a very high smoke point. So, so you don't want to burn the oil when you're cooking with it. Um, and ghee is probably, you know, for most people, the best answer, um, unless you are extremely sensitive to dairy proteins, which, you know, there may be a tiny amount in left in ghee. Um, that you can't get rid of. I think there may actually be one ghee product that that says that they get rid of all the dairy proteins. Like they they make a a real concerted effort to do that. But for the vast majority of people, ghee um, clarified butter essentially. You know, it's butter that's been clarified, and so you can easily make this at home with just butter. You buy the butter and you <clears throat> kind of put it on a very very low simmer, and it separates um, some solids out of the butter and leaves you with a cooking oil. That uh, has a high smoke point. Um, and then, you know, things like duck fat and other things are, are great for cooking because they have high smoke points. Uh, lard, you know, these animal fats are fantastic as well. So th those are some thoughts on that. David says, uh, one neurologist asked if I had seen a psychiatrist yet. Yeah, um, that's unfortunate. Thoughts on, Louis says, thoughts on vitamin D natural lighting lamp from Amazon. I live in a cold place and barely see direct sunlight in the winter. Yeah, I think that that is one way of doing it. It seems to make sense. Um, I think the kind of the natural, you know, caveman way of doing it is to eat foods that are high in vitamin D. So, you know, probably a combination of those two is great. So eat liver and um, you can actually buy canned cod liver, uh, which is, you know, tastier than it sounds. <laughs> Um, or cod liver oil. So get cod liver oil. Uh, I think maybe the canned cod liver might actually be better than the cod liver oil. I don't know. Uh, but Rosita cod liver oil, I know it's expensive, but it's really the best in the world. Um, if you can't get that, then maybe the... Um... So with cod liver oil, one thing I found is that they, sometimes they remove the vitamins and then they add them back in so that they can put the standard quantities on the label. And that, that's a problem, right? So with cod liver, you, you want, you're looking for vitamin A and vitamin D. Um, vitamin A isn't that high in animal liver. You have a high amount of vitamin D in animal liver, but you need to balance vitamin D intake with vitamin A. So they, they need to be about the same to balance out and to balance, you know, they affect two parts, two arms of the immune system. And, and they just have this, they limit each other's toxicity and it's important to get both. So it's actually important to get all the fat soluble vitamins. So E and K are also really important. Vitamin K and vitamin K2 especially is really important for D uh, to balance calcium metabolism and then vitamin E. So they're all important because if you overdo one or two, then you'll decrease the levels of the others. 
So you need the alpha tocopherol version of vitamin E. So in general, try to get stuff from food um, and sun and or light. And if not, take a supplement. Marilza says, how about, but yeah, those lighting lamps work great for a lot of people who develop seasonal affective disorder or this depression that happens when they're, when they don't get enough sun. And so I think it probably works best for people whose ancestors came from a place that didn't have limited natural, you know, wavelengths of sunlight in the winter. So a lot of people whose ancestors grew up near the equator or, you know, uh, evolved near the equator when they move to like New York or something, um, they may not be able to really like vitamin D from liver and stuff may not cut it for them, right? Like their body is really starving for sunlight. And so for them, probably the, the lighting, the lamps are best, but for people who come have Northern European ancestors that, you know, evolved with low levels of, um, those wavelengths of sunlight that trigger vitamin D in your skin, uh, if they evolved at those, um, what is it, longitude or latitude, at those latitudes, um, then then they may not really need the light. They may just, you know, they evolved, they solved their problem by, you know, drinking cod liver oil. <laughs> that was their solution. And so for some people, you know, lily white skin, you know, Northern European ancestors, maybe you just need cod liver oil and some, some animal liver and you'll be fine and you don't need the sunlight or the natural lighting lamp. Whereas other people whose ancestors... Uh, evolved near the equator, they may actually need the lamp. Uh, light does do different things in your body than what, you know, it doesn't just trigger vitamin D. It triggers um, probably hundreds of different chemical reactions and it, um, you know, reduces sulfate in your blood vessels and it triggers uh, T cell activity and all kinds of things, right? It raises serotonin levels. It has all these other benefits beyond vitamin D. Um, I would imagine that some of those benefits come from the vitamin D rich foods uh, but some of them may not. And so, so, so basically the approach here is to think of it, of it from an evolutionary perspective. Again, if your ancestors grew up near the equator or, you know, evolved near the equator or lived for thousands, millions of years near the equator, maybe not millions, hundreds, tens of thousands of years near the equator, if those are your ancestors, or at least some of your ancestors, you may really need the sun all year round, right? You may not be able to, to make it with just foods that are rich in vitamin D and vitamin A. So hopefully that answers the question. Marilza says, how about autoimmune diseases can functional medicine? Yeah, absolutely. Autoimmune diseases are some of the easiest things to fix with functional medicine, honestly. Um, so yeah, you know, you know, type one diabetes you can, is probably just an autoimmune disease, essentially. Some of the autoimmune diseases get fixed faster, right? Like, so, so there's common ones that are really common in the, in the society, like thyroid, autoimmune thyroid disease, it, it seems to be pretty easy to fix, right? So the functional medicine approach with thi autoimmune thyroid disease is spelled out pretty much by, um, uh, who is it? Elizabeth Wentz, I think, uh, thyroidpharmacist.com. She has a couple of books. And, and again, it seems kind of overwhelming, right? So just get into it slowly, slowly, uh, you know. So so she kind of spells out the, the lifestyle changes you need to make, the dietary changes you need to make, you know, basically autoimmune paleo diet, some supplements, and, um, and for most people that'll fix their autoimmune thyroid disease very fast. Um, and then the, the ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, that's another one. Um, multiple sclerosis is a great example of an autoimmune disease, which again, there's tons of data on at least anecdotal data. Uh, so there was a famous doctor who wrote a book called the walls protocol, Terry walls. She fixed her, she essentially healed her own autoimmune disease and other people have followed her protocol. And again, it's the, it's the same kind of like, there's this autoimmune protocol that works for 99% of people. It's just autoimmune paleo diet, take some supplements uh, and then fix up your lifestyle in general, right? Like all the stuff we talk about with Michelle that I talk about, do something to balance your autonomic nervous system, like Qigong, yoga, Tai Chi, breathing exercises, cold plunges, sauna, you know, meditation, you know, something from, you know, come up with your own program that addresses balancing the sympathetic nervous system is one of the most important things. Um, changing your belief system. You got to get rid of the limiting beliefs, uh, sleeping well, spending time with friends and family and loved ones, uh, eating properly, um, eating, you know, maybe doing some intermittent fasting, you know, all these things fall in, in limiting social media and, you know, so all these things fall under the lifestyle aspect of, of curing any chronic illness. Um, 
All right, so I have an appointment coming up um, with a patient, let's see, in a couple of minutes. So I'm going to, um, I know we have a few more questions. Hopefully we answer them in the groups where they were asked and uh, look forward to talking to um our functional medicine doctor next Tuesday, uh, I think we'll have him on and, and we'll try to probably make that a weekly thing for at least a few weeks and gauge the interest of people for watching it and, and just talk about uh, functional medicine and, and some of the things that you can do with functional medicine and who it might benefit. And, and we'll address some of the questions that I talked about today and we'll also take audience questions hopefully on Tuesday. All right, everyone, thanks for watching. Um, like and subscribe and share. And, uh, and again, I'm back on Twitter. Uh, we are on Rumble. We have a Facebook group, um, Long Haul Reset, that you can join. Um, and those are essentially the areas where we communicate with patients. And my go-to doc, if you're not aware of that, or, you know, that's my online telemedicine platform. You can register there for free. Um, there's a little checkbox in the registration form when you get to the part that has the the fee in there the consult fee there's a checkbox right under it that says i don't want to pay right now i just want to ask questions or i can't afford to pay and i'd like a discount you know so you can check that and it zeroes out the fee during registration um and so in or during a follow-up visit even so if people can't afford something uh you know an asynchronous consult then we offer those for free uh, but i just want you know to remind people that my go-to doc you can register for free and if you have like a specific question that's really specific to you and we need to i need to understand the context that's probably the best place to get it answered is to become a patient and i have access to your medical records and your medical history and we can answer your questions more specifically through there and some people we've helped them to heal from like long COVID and vaccine injuries and they, we've never charged them a dime because they just they already had access to medications or they got them somewhere else or they ordered them from India or and they had the supplements and they just needed to know what to do with them, right? So, for example, uh, the nurse, Cindy, um, I forget her last name right now, but uh, she was one of those patients where, where I... I never charged her anything. She just asked me, what do I need to do? I, I have what I need to take, but I don't, I'm not sure how to take it or how often to take her or how long to take it for. And we just kind of led her through over the course of months and she cured her, her long COVID. Um, so, so that's one, I think one of the, the most, you know, beneficial things about my go-to doc. Um, all right. Thanks everyone for watching.